Hey everybody, hopefully you can see my screen. We're gonna go ahead and get started. And today we're gonna talk about food labeling. So we're first gonna go over just an overview of food labels, and then we're gonna kind of break down the label into the next kind of parts you see on your screen, serving sizes, calories, the nutrients listed, percent daily value, the ingredient list. And then I also just wanna end this on misleading claims because there are a lot of things that packages do and processed foods do and just any kind of food product, bags, boxes, all of that stuff that try to grab your attention. And so I wanna make sure I bring attention to that too as well. So overview of food labels. The Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Ag have certain requirements about what can be printed on food labels. And the food label found on packaged foods and beverages, that's basically just a daily tool for you to help you make informed food choices that can contribute to healthier eating habits. The information in the main or the top section is of the sample nutrition that you can see on here, the label is gonna vary with each food and beverage product, of course. It's gonna contain the product specific information, your serving sizes, calories, nutrient information. And then the bottom section is gonna contain a footnote that explains the percent daily value and gives the number of calories used for general nutrition advice. And we'll talk about percent daily value too, as well. So let's start with serving sizes. So when you're looking at the nutrition facts label, first take a look at the number of servings in the package or servings per container and the serving size. Serving sizes are standardized to make it easier to compare similar foods. And they're gonna be provided in units that are gonna be familiar, familiar to us like cups or pieces. And then that's gonna be followed by the metric amount. So the number of grams. And it's important to realize that all the nutrient amounts shown on the label, including the number of calories, that re all refers to the size of the serving. So pay attention to the serving size, especially how many servings there are in a food package. For example, you might ask yourself if you're consuming half a serving, one serving or more. In the sample label, one serving of lasagna equals one cup. So if you ate two cups, you would be consuming two servings, obviously. So that means doubling and two times the calories and nutrients shown in the sample label. So you would have to double the nutrient and the calorie amounts as well as the percent daily values to see what you're actually getting in those two servings. Next up is gonna be calories. The word no one likes. So calories provide a measure of how much energy you get from a serving of this food. So in this example, there are 280 calories in one serving of lasagna. So what happens if you ate the entire package? Well, then you would consume four servings. As you can see up in the top, there's four servings per container or 1,120 calories. So to achieve or maintain a healthy body weight, we have to balance the number of calories we eat and drink in the day with the number of calories that our body uses, which we talked about with our metabolism and exercise and all of those things that we talked about in week two. 2000 calories a day is a very, very general guide for nutrition advice. But again, like we kind of talked about with macro and metabolism too, your calorie needs are gonna be either higher or lower than that depending on your age, your sex, your height, your weight, and your physical activity level. But a lot of times percent daily value and everything that new labels are gonna represent are based off of that 2000 calorie a day intake. So now let's go into nutrients. So look at section three in the sample label and it's gonna show you some of the key nutrients that impact your health. So you can use a label to support your personal dietary needs, looking for foods that contain more of the nutrients that you want to get more of and less of the nutrients that you want to limit. So we've got fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrates, which get broken down into three components, protein and vitamins and minerals. And we're gonna break each one down in the upcoming slides. And I don't wanna get too crazy in it because we did talk about all of these in macronutrients and micronutrients for our presentations, but I'm still gonna get into them a little bit and how they relay on your label. So starting with fat. Total fat on the nutrition facts label includes saturated fat, which is found in higher proportions in animal products, and it's usually solid at room temperature. Saturated fat is found in animal fats, baked goods, condiments, gravies, and dairy products. 
desserts, meats, and poultry, processed meats and poultry products, pizza, salad dressing, snack food, sandwiches, and the list goes on and on. It also includes trans fats, which are formed naturally, and that's going to be found in small amounts in dairy products, beef, and lamb. Trans fat formed artificially during food processing is found in hydrogenated oils, which then is used in a variety of foods like baked goods and coffee creamer, um, your frostings, your snack foods. Actually, as of 2018, most uses of this partially hydrogenated oils, the main source of that artificial trans fat, had been phased out. So trans fat is also present at very low levels in refined vegetable oils too as well. And lastly, not shown on this label example, it includes monosaturated and polyunsaturated fats. And those are found in higher proportions in plants and are usually liquid at room temperature, such as oils. Mono and polyunsaturated fats are gonna be found in avocados, fish, mayo, oil-based salad dressing, nuts, olives, seeds, and so on. So fat provides calories or energy for the body. Each gram of fat provides nine calories. So that's how we figure out calories. So if you look at the label, there's nine grams of fat. You would take nine times nine, and that's how many calories of fat are gonna be in that serving that you're eating. So as we know, fat also stores energy in excess of what the body needs immediately and serves as a secondary energy source once carbohydrates are used up, which of course we talked about too as well. And then other functions of fat, they're basic part of cell membranes, necessary for proper growth and development. They help absorb important vitamins. Um, it supports key body processes such as blood clotting, nervous system function, reproduction, and immune system. So fats are very vital and we definitely need to have a balanced diet that contains fats. Moving on to cholesterol. So cholesterol is a structural component of the cell membrane and it's waxy and it's kind of a fat-like substance and it's found in all cells of the body. It's produced by the body, primarily by your liver, and it's also consumed from food and that's referred to as dietary cholesterol. So that's how we differentiate those. The human body makes all of the cholesterol that it needs, so it's not necessary to get all this extra cholesterol from food. So dietary cholesterol is found only in animal products. So beef fat, chicken fat, pork fat, and then dairy products too as well, and egg yolks and meat and poultry. Processed meat and poultry products like bacon and hot dogs, um, shellfish and spreads is also where you're gonna find that. So cholesterol, just a little fact about it, is necessary for the production of bile, and that's a fluid made by the liver that aids in digestion of fat in the intestine. Cholesterol is also used to make vitamin D and certain hormones like estrogen and testosterone. So we need it, but that dietary cholesterol is what we kind of always need to watch out for. And then sodium. Over 70% of dietary sodium comes from eating packaged and prepared foods, whereas only a small portion, like about 11%, comes from the salt added to food when cooking and eating. And according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, half of the sodium consumed by Americans comes from the following foods, which you're going to get a note here. They are all processed and prepared. So breads and rolls, it's crazy how much sodium is in a slice of bread if you've never looked at that too as well. Um, pizza, sandwiches, cold cuts, cured meats, soups. Soups are big culprits for sodium. Um, burritos, tacos, snack foods like chips and crackers and popcorn, chicken and cheese. So sodium, although it does get a bad rep sometimes, it's a, an essential nutrient and we need it, but we need it in relatively small amounts. Sodium is important for many body processes, such as fluid balance, because it's provided that substantial sweating does not occur, which is why sodium is so important. Muscle contraction and nervous system function. So sodium really comes into play um, when we're physically active. And then carbohydrates. So found primarily in plant foods, as we know, the exception in some dairy products, which contain milk sugar, which is lactose. Total carbohydrates on the nutrition label includes dietary fiber, total sugars and sugar alcohols. All three we'll talk about here in the next few slides, but looking at carbohydrates as a whole, we know that they provide energy for the body. And compared to fat, where each gram of fat provided nine calories, each gram of carbohydrate provides four calories. So that's why fat is always a higher contributor to our total calorie because it's worth nine 
and carbs are worth four. The human body breaks down carbohydrates into glucose and glucose in the blood, which we can refer to as blood sugar. We know that's our primary energy source from the, for the body's cells, tissues, and organs. So again, we talked about that during metabolism, so we're not gonna get too in depth into that. But to break it down, let's start with fiber. So dietary fiber is a type of carbohydrate made up of many sugar molecules that are linked together. But unlike carbohydrates, fiber is bound together in such a way that it's really not easily digested by our small intestine. And there are two types of dietary fiber. There's soluble, which dissolves in water, and that kind of forms a thick gel-like substance in our stomach. And that's broken down by bacteria in your large intestine, and it provides some calories. And then there's insoluble fiber, which does not dissolve in water, and it can pass through your GI tract relatively intact, and therefore it's not a source of calories. Soluble dietary fiber can interfere with the absorption of dietary fat and cholesterol. So this in turn helps lower our low density lipoprotein, our LDL or bad cholesterol levels in our blood. Fiber can also slow digestion and the rate at which carbohydrates and other nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream. So this helps control our blood glucose, our blood sugars. So it prevents that rapid rise in our blood sugar following a meal. And insoluble fi dietary fiber can also speed up the movement of food and waste through your digestive system. So both forms of these fiber can make you feel full, which can in turn help lower your calorie intake and help you eat less and stay satisfied for longer. So people who have a diet that are higher in dietary fiber can increase the frequency of bowel movements. They can reduce the risk of developing cardiovascular disease. And naturally occurring dietary fiber is found in a variety of foods, um, beans, peas, fruits, nuts, seeds, vegetables, wheat bran, whole grains, and foods made with whole grain ingredients like bread, cereals, crackers, and pasta. So let's move on to sugar. Sugars are the smallest and simplest type of carbohydrate, super easy to digest and be absorbed by the body. All sugars provide calories or energy for the body, just like carbs, they're gonna be the same, they're gonna provide four calories. The human body breaks down sugars and other carbohydrates into glucose. And we know, again, that's our primary energy source. And then if you look at the total sugars on the label, sugars that are naturally present in many nutritious foods and beverages, like sugar and milk and fruit. And then there's added sugars, which include sugars that were added during the processing of the food. So one that might sound familiar is sucrose. And these are also going to be in foods that are packaged as sweeteners, like table sugar, sugars from syrups and honey, and sugars from concentrated fruit or vegetable juices. And we know that sugar is found in a variety of food, dairy products, fruit, not just whole fruit, but like frozen, dried, and canned, um, fruit and vegetable juice, baked goods, desserts, salad dressings, gravies. There, I mean, sugar is in everything. It's honestly kind of crazy that we don't really have much of a limit of things that we can add sugar to, but that's going to be sugar. And then let's go into sugar alcohols because this is a little different. So sugar alcohols are found naturally in small amounts in a variety of fruits and vegetables. And they're also commercially produced from sugars and starch. So commercially produced sugar alcohols are added to foods basically as a reduced calorie sweetener. And they're found in a lot of our sugar-free or reduced sugar products. So those cakes and cookies and pies, um, your gum, your desserts, jam and jelly, frostings, and different kind of um, candies like Jolly Ranchers and those things. Sugar alcohols are a type of carbohydrate that chemically have the characteristics of both sugar and alcohol, but they're not completely absorbed by the body. So it provides a sweet taste with fewer calories per gram than regular sugar. And a lot of times, and a lot, and lately I should say, it's used in place of sugar and often in a combination with artificial, artificial sweeteners too as well. And then protein, so moving away from carbohydrates, we know protein can be found in foods, both from plants and animals. If you remember, protein is made up of hundreds and thousands of amino acids, which are linked together to form those long chains. And the sequence that the amino acids are in that determines that protein's unique structure and its specific function, because there are so many different proteins that our body needs to function on. It's not just straight basic protein. 
Protein is going to be found in beans and peas, dairy, meats and poultry, nuts and seeds, seafood, and soy food products. And just like carbohydrates, each gram of protein provides four calories. Protein is a component of every cell in your body, and it's necessary for growth and development, especially during childhood, adolescence, and pregnancy. And other function of protein are it helps your body build and repair cells and body tissue. It's a major part of your skin, hair, nails, muscle, bone, and internal organs. And it's also found in almost all of our body fluids. And protein is super important for many body processes, such as blood clotting, fluid balance, immune response, your vision, and production of hormones, antibodies, and enzymes. So protein's not just about building muscle. It does a lot more than you think. And then vitamins and minerals, which Carrie led us through all of this last week too as well. So we know that vitamins are organic substances that are naturally present in our plant and animal products. You obtain vitamins from both those plant and animal products that you eat. The human body makes vitamins D and K. And there are 14 vitamins that may be listed on your Nutrition Facts label. And then minerals are inorganic substances that are found naturally in our soil and water, which are then absorbed by plants, which are then eaten by people and other animals. And people obtain minerals from, again, eating those plants and animal products that they eat. And there are 14 minerals that could be listed on the Nutrition Facts label. Vitamins and minerals are found in a variety of foods, beans, peas, dairy, eggs, fortified foods, fruits, grains, meats, nuts and seeds, seafood, soy, and vegetables. The human body needs the right mix of nutrients for good health, which is something Carrie stressed last week too as well. Consuming the recommended daily amounts of vitamins and minerals in addition to carbohydrates, protein, fat, and fiber is going to help support many of our body's important processes. So a lot of times people are always so focused on fat and carbs and protein that we tend to forget about everything under this thick black bar on our label. And we need to start paying a lot more attention to our vitamin and mineral consumption too as well. Come on, slide. There we go. All right, so nutrients to get less of. So saturated fat, sodium, and added sugars. Those are nutrients that are listed on the label that may be associated with adverse health effects. And Americans generally consume far too much of them. So they are identified as nutrients to get less of. So eating too much saturated fat and sodium, for example, is associated with an increased risk of developing health conditions like cardiovascular disease and high blood pressure. And consuming too much added sugars can make it hard to meet important nutrient needs while staying within your calorie limits. And then on the opposite end of that, nutrients that we need to get more of, dietary fiber, vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium are nutrients on the label that Americans do not generally get the recommended amount of. So eating a diet high in dietary fiber is gonna increase your frequency of bowel movements, it's gonna lower your blood sugar and your cholesterol levels, and it's gonna reduce your calorie intake because again, you're feeling fuller for longer. Diets higher in vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium help reduce the risk of developing osteoporosis, anemia, and high blood pressure. So just some things to think about. And next up, let's talk about that percent daily value that a lot of us might kind of skip over. So I know this kind of looks like a lot, but we'll walk through it. So the percent daily value is a percentage of the daily value for each nutrient in a serving of food. And they're always in reference amounts expressed in grams, milligrams, or micrograms of the nutrients to consume or not to exceed each day. So a general guide, so 5% daily value is DV or less of a nutrient per serving is considered low and 20% is gonna be considered high. And more often we wanna choose foods that are higher in percent daily value for fiber, vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium, and then lower in saturated fat, sodium, and added sugar. So notice that last little point on there, those are the ones, the top ones, the ones we wanna get more of. And then obviously we want lower percent daily value for those ones we want to avoid. So do you need to know how to calculate percentages to use this? No, the label does that math for you. It's gonna help you interpret the nutrient numbers 
by putting them all on the same scale for the day of zero to 100. It doesn't add up vertically to 100. Instead, the percent daily value is the percentage of the daily value for each nutrient. And so it's gonna tell you if a serving of food is high or low in a nutrient and whether a serving of the food contributes a lot or a little to your daily diet. So really what the key thing I want you to take away from this is remembering the five and the 20. So we know that if it has 5%, that's considered pretty low. And then 20%, that's considered very high. So we want foods that are in that 20% or more considered high if they're in those foods that we want to get more from, fiber, vitamin D, and so on. And then, of course, looking at foods that are 5% or lower when we're looking at those parts on our label that we want to avoid, like saturated fat, sodium, and added sugars. And you can kind of use this to compare foods with different products. So you can look at the back of the label. And more often, you can choose products that are going to be higher in those nutrients you want to get more of. And lower in the nutrients, of course, we want to get less in. So now we're going to talk about what to look for and other ingredients that you might recognize included in the label and may want to know more about. So in addition to the nutrient facts label, the ingredient list is a very, very helpful tool. The ingredient list shows each ingredient in a food by its common or useful name and ingredients that are listed in descending order by weight. So the ingredient that weighs the most in that product is gonna be listed first. And then the ingredient that weighs the least is listed last. So basically in this product, what was used more of is going to be first and what was hardly used kind of gets towards the end, the bottom of the list. So like I said, they're listed by quantity from highest to lowest amount. A good rule of thumb is to scan the first three ingredients as they make up the largest part of what you're eating. If the first ingredients include refined grains, a type of sugar or hydrogenated oils, you can pretty much assume that that product is gonna be unhealthy. Instead, try choosing items that have whole foods listed as their first three ingredients. In addition, an ingredients list that is longer than two or three lines is gonna suggest that that product is very highly processed. So that's another really good thing to look at too as well. Also included on our ingredient list, I know this is a lot, but this was the easiest way to put everything on the slide. Um, sugar, it goes by countless names. A lot of times you might not even recognize it. And food manufacturers are gonna use this to their advantage by purposely adding many different types of sugars to their products and hide the actual amount. So in doing so, they can list the healthy ingredient at the top and mention sugar further down. So even though a product may be loaded with sugar, it doesn't necessarily appear as one of the first three ingredients. So this is where they trick you. There can be sugar in a product, but on the ingredient list, they will name it two different ways and they'll kind of put it throughout the ingredient list. So it might not be close to the top in that top three, but it might be the fourth or the fifth. And then the rest of the sugar might be down at the bottom, but it's still sugar. They just broke it up into two different names that have the same function of sugar. So to avoid accidentally consuming a lot of sugar, watch out for the following names of sugar in this ingredient list. And so again, you guys always get the slides at the end of this. So that's why I wanted to make sure I put these on the slide. So these are all different names that they use for sugar. So just something else that we have to look out for when we're purchasing products. Another thing that gets some rep in the media is gonna be high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup has crept into more of our foods over the last few decades. Compared with regular sugar, it's cheaper and it's sweeter and it's more quickly absorbed into your body. But eating too much high fructose corn syrup can lead to insulin re resistance, obesity, type two diabetes, and high blood pressure. So another thing we definitely want you to look out for. And food dyes. Artificial food dyes are responsible for the bright colors of our candy, our drinks, and our baked goods. And they're even used in certain brands of pickles, lunch meat, cheese, smoked salmon, and salad dressing, and some of our medications. In fact, artificial food dye consumption has increased by 500% in the last 50 years. And sadly, children are gonna be the biggest of our consumers. So artificial colors, harmful, harmless, or helpful. Now I know we tell people to eat the rainbow of bright, colorful foods, but not that colorful. We don't want fake colorful. 
We know now that artificial colors are harmful. Studies show artificial colors increase impulsivity, inattentiveness, and hyperactivity among young children. And they have now been repeated calls to better regulate or ban artificial colors altogether. So that's just something else to even look at. I don't know about you, but it really bothered me when I saw that lunch meat has food dye in it because it's meat. So I don't understand why we have to color it. So that was just one that really jumped out at me. So I wanted to make sure I put that on there too. So just to mention too, I wanted to share more on caramel coloring and red dye. Caramel coloring may be the most widely consumed food coloring in the world. Again, back to the whole lunch meat thing, that's gonna be what's in there. Unfortunately, it's manufactured and can sometimes lead to the formation of a carcinogen. And it has been identified as a cancer causing chemical. And so that's why these are trying to go into propositions and labeling laws so you can limit the amount of these colorings that are being added to our foods. And with red dye, um, red dye number one was actually banned in 1961. Red dye number two was banned in 1976. And then red number four was banned. So red number three is actually still used today in everything from your sausages to maraschino cherries. And it was recently found to cause DNA damage in human liver cells, comparable to the damage by like a chemotherapy drug whose purpose is to break down our DNA. And we know that red dyes and colorings have been found to influence children's behavior too as well. So just something for you to kind of think about and look about when you're trying to buy products too as well. And when you're looking at that ingredient list, you can look like you can see at the bottom, natural flavor, caramel color. And that's for oven roasted turkey breast. So just something to think about, nothing to totally scare you with, but I just like to bring attention to some things. So lastly, our misleading claims. This is the one I really wanna hit home with. I'm sure we've all recognized these stickers before on our labeling. And one of the best tips is honestly to completely ignore the front of your package. Front labels try to lure you into purchasing products by making health claims. In fact, research shows that adding health claims to the front labels make people believe a product is healthier than the same product that doesn't list that claim on the front. So of course that's gonna affect our consumer choices when we're in the store. And we know that manufacturers are often very dishonest and the way that they use these labels, they tend to use health claims that are misleading and in some cases just downright false. Examples include many high sugar breakfast cereals like Cocoa Puffs. Despite what the label may imply, these products are not healthy, but if they put on there that they're made with whole grain, just because there's whole grain in that ingredient list, it's not in the top three. It's you know way down at the bottom. So definitely things you wanna think about because this is where they try to trick us is in our ingredient list and on the labels themselves, there are regulations of what you have to put on there and how much foods can have, you know, certain nutrients and different things like that. But this is where they trick you and say, okay, we'll hide that there, but then let's, you know, act like it's super healthy for us by putting this on the front and also this on the front to grab people's attention. So totally try to ignore the front of our packaging. So as I just said, health claims on packaged foods are designed to catch your attention and convince you that the product is healthy. So just to kind of break it down, some of the words that they might use. So light products are processed to reduce either calories or fat. And some products are just simply watered down just to make it light. So check carefully to make sure if anything else has been added instead, like sugar. Multigrain sounds very healthy, but it only means that the product contains more than one type of grain more than likely refined unless the product is actually marked as whole grain. So just because it says multigrain doesn't mean it's whole grain. Natural, this doesn't mean that the product resembles anything natural. It just indicates that at one point, the manufacturer worked with a natural source like apples. And organic, this says very little about whether a product is healthy. For example, organic sugar is still sugar. And then no added sugar. Some products are naturally high in sugar, and the fact that they don't have added sugar doesn't mean that they're healthy. It just means that they don't have added sugar, but they still have other sugar. Low calorie. Um, low calorie products have to have one third fewer calories than the brand's original product. 
yet one brand's low calorie version may have similar calories to another brand's original. And then low fat, this just means that the fat's been reduced at the cost of adding more sugar. So again, check the ingredient list. Low carb, recently, you know, we got the whole low carb diet craze, which we'll talk about diet trends too later on in our series. Um, but processed foods that are labeled low carb, they're usually still processed junk food and they're gonna be similar to processed low fat foods. And then if something's been made with whole grains, it contains very little whole grains. So check that ingredient list. If it's not in the first three, then it's negligible. Uh, fortified or enriched. This means that some nutrients have just been added to the product. For example, vitamin D is often added to milk, yet just because something is fortified doesn't make it healthy. Gluten-free. Gluten-free doesn't mean healthy at all. The product simply doesn't contain wheat, spelt, rye, or barley, and that's all it means to be gluten-free. Fruit flavored. Many processed foods have a name that refers to a natural flavor, such as strawberry yogurt, but it probably doesn't even contain a single fruit, just chemicals designed to taste like fruit. And then lastly, zero trans fat. This phrase means less than 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving. Thus, if the serving sizes are misleadingly small, it's still gonna contain a lot of trans fat. Um, that's where they get you on like cookies or like um, small, like Teddy Grahams, different things like that. That's where they trick you for that too as well. So despite these cautionary words, many truly healthy foods are organic. They are whole grain or they are natural. Still, just because a label makes certain claims doesn't guarantee that it's healthy. So basically what I'm saying is I want you guys to take your reading glasses with you when you go grocery shopping and check that ingredient list and just try to have a more open mind and take your time when you're grocery shopping next time and just try to compare foods and see how they're different too as well. All right, does anybody have any questions? I do. Go for it. Yeah, a couple. Um, so when they list the fat and then the cholesterol, is the cholesterol, the fat and that's, you know, made up of the cholesterol or the cholesterol that's made up of fat included in the fat percentage? So no, that will be its separate entity because it'll depend if it's the cholesterol that naturally occurs in our body or if it's dietary cholesterol. But regardless, so that'll be separate. More fat than, than the label reads because you got to account for the fat and the cholesterol too, right? Technically correct. Yes, you got it. Okay, that's, that's a, a, a huge... Um, revelation for me because you know you look at the fat content and you think okay well it's only got four grams of fat but then you don't look at the cholesterol right you know, so. yep yep that's another way they get you yeah and then another thing is um carrageen and I see it a lot in um in a lot of different things like uh like coffee creamer that's you know, and cheeses and yogurts and stuff like that. And, and I just hear bad things about carrageenan, and like it's, you know, very inflammatory for your body and, um, you know, it can contribute to rheumatoid arthritis and just a lot of different things. So why did they put it in the product to begin with? So basically it's all about flavor profile and making it, if it's something that needs to be thick, like a coffee creamer, a lot of times it just comes down to like the chemicalness of it and how it can make that product what they want it to be. But again, if they only have to put a less amount in it to, you know, qualify it to be safe or healthy for you to consume, then that's what they're going to do too as well. There are still a lot of things that they put into our foods, again, like the dyes and the artificial coloring that's related to and linked to all of these different causes and different things like that, but they're still putting it into our food. So that's something that we can take up with the FDA and the government together, <laughs> but there has to be extensive, extensive cases to make them really look into things and stop putting them into foods. And so far that's just something that hasn't been that brought up in the research. Okay, that's, and there, I, you just brought up another question for me, and that is, 
like GMOs, there's no labeling for GMOs. So you have no idea whether something is coming from a genetically modified source or, you know, a truly natural source. And do you know if there's any um, intention to start, you know, putting something that's uh, GMO um, on labels? Um, so like, what's really crazy is like GMOs really didn't get anything and like no laws were done until 2016 by Obama to get that federal labeling bill that recognizes that USDA products qualify for non-GMO claims like in the marketplace themselves. Um, but I do know a more regulated regulation was brought into effect in 2019 and I know they still are working on that because so that basically bills get regulated and then it takes two, three or more years for companies that have to start complying. And I think complying by that one that was in 2019 starts next year. So labels and everything will, companies will have to comply. I'm pretty sure it's like January 1st, if I remember right. So just because something gets passed into a bill and it's now regulated, companies have a few years to comply. So hopefully by next year we've got a lot more things that are actually truly represented with GMO labeling. That's good to know. Yes. Awesome. Any other questions by anybody? Check the chat, got a thanks, awesome. All right, well, thank you for your questions. That was awesome. And I hope everybody has a good rest of your day and next week, we will talk about adult nutrition and I will have a, um, a little like cooking demonstration for you too as well. I'm going to show you one of my favorite lunches that I meal prep with because you're going to notice during this whole series that I really hit home on fiber <laughs> because we all suck at eating fiber and I want to show you some really sneaky ways that you can get in some more fiber. So we'll have a little video of a little cooking demo too as well. So we'll talk about adult nutrition next week. And then we'll also have a little cooking demo. So hope to virtually see you all next week and have a great weekend.